This is Talk Business and Politics with Roby Brock. And welcome to today's Talk Business and Politics Daily. I'm Roby Brock, joined now to talk some politics, healthcare policy with Jessica Deloach Saban. She's a Talk Business and Politics contributor, and Robert Kuhn, who is also a Talk Business and Politics contributor and uh, a partner at Impact Management Group, do a lot of political consulting. You've been polling healthcare? Not yet. Not yet. Might soon. But you are anxious <laughs> to poll some health care, I suppose. All right, let's talk about the health care law. It is in a state of flux as we talk. Probably 12 things have probably developed and changed <laughs> in the news cycle. Uh, but we're just going to go with the best available of what we've got. Let's begin with Jessica. I will give you first crack okay. at what is good and bad about the health care bill for Arkansas. When I was thinking about something good, I was thinking about how there are certain Republican senators who have expressed their concerns about the bill and needing more time to look over things. Now, I do understand that their hesitations are probably not the same as the hesitations that I have, but I do think that the one thing everything need, everyone needs is more time to look over what's been presented because we're not talking about a simple policy or an unimportant policy. We're talking about one of the most important overhauls to policy we will see for a very long time. Yeah, how about you, Robert? Well, I think when you look at the Senate health care proposal, where it comes from a positive standpoint is really dealing with the exchanges, and that's not really been as big of an issue in Arkansas because our exchange business has been fairly stable. Across the country, though, you've got a lot of exchanges where policies are very unaffordable. You've seen steep rate increases. I think the Senate plan will help the exchange business. I don't think, as written today, that the Medicaid side is really a success at this point with what the Senate's put out. I think that's, that's problematic. The Medicaid expansion portion of the bill has huge ramifications for Arkansas. Governor Hutchinson has expressed some reservations about it. Our two U.S. senators a little mum at this point in time about it. Um, but kind of, I guess, Robert, I'll come to you first on this. How, how could they craft a solution that would be good for Arkansas in terms of Medicaid expansion? Sure. Uh, I think what they've done around flexibility and giving the states the opportunity to innovate and get waivers for certain things is really a good start. I think when you get into the funding that they're going to reduce for Medicaid, I think that's where you start having a problem. Uh, you know, with Arkansas, the way we've kind of handled our expansion with Arkansas Works, that has had a really strong effect on stabilizing our exchange business because of the way that those policies are sold because they're, they're sold under a private plan rather than with traditional Medicaid. So you have a stabilizing effect. Arkansas in some ways could be a model for how to do Medicaid in a more pro-business way, uh, but you know, they, they can't take away the, the amount of money that they're looking to take away as quickly as they are for that to work. Yeah, Jessica? Yeah, well, I think that the changes to Medicaid would be devastating to our state if our state can't find a creative way to work around whatever changes may come. You've seen people protesting uh, in Washington, D.C. at their elected officials' offices about how these changes are so severe and how they would have a devastating effect on their lives. That same situation applies to so many people here in Arkansas because the way we handled uh, our expansion of health care helped hundreds of thousands of people in the state. Right. And now we don't, there's a fogginess around that and these people who are just now receiving care are now wondering, what about me? What's next? Should I be worried? And I would say you don't want anyone to panic, but yes, you should be concerned because you don't have any answers right now. And, and we won't have any answers until we know what's going to happen in the Senate. The gist though is the Medicaid expansion population between 100% and 138% shifts to the exchanges though. That's kind of the plan for Arkansas, isn't it? It is the plan, but I do think that, you know, states are now going to be allowed to make more rules about who can qualify for what and we can put more requirements on people based on what they qualify for. And I think that there are going to be some people who take issue with that because it's hard when you're when you're writing policy and you're creating different steps to say, okay, this these people can qualify, but these people can't. There are always going to be some people who fall between the cracks that are left out and there's no answer for them. So I think that this policy should be meant to evolve. But I do think that it's a lot more challenging than people give it credit for being. Good news for lobbyists, though. Isn't well, it? yeah, and of course, <laughs> which is great. Um, you know, the, the 100 to 138 shift really was led by the governor already, uh, and the legislature kind of signed on with that in order to kind of shift some of those folks over to the exchange. I think the real concern with the Senate bill is that it would, it would really start addressing some of the funding for people below 100, and so you will see some attrition of who's really eligible and how much money can be spent. And I think from a state perspective, they always knew they were going to have to drop down to, to, to a 90-10 split. 
even Arkansas above the average of nationally getting somewhere around 70% is still higher than most, but I don't know that a 70-30 split is really going to be able to cash flow the plan as it is today let's with as many with, people as it covers. Let's deal with this nuance because this is a debate that is really along partisan lines here, and that is that people will have choices to make under the new GOP version of health care in terms of there's not going to be the, the individual mandates won't be there, the employer mandates won't be there. Uh, young people can or cannot get into those plans. To some extent, that is a choice issue. I could choose as a young person to not have health insurance because I'm not worried about my health. I'd rather put that money somewhere else. At the same time, there are some people that don't need that vulnerability and it might be a function more of them not being able to afford any type of health care. How do, how, do how do you balance all of that in terms of its fair public policy? That's a big hefty question, I know, but... Well, there, there are some scarier elements to this. I mean, these are things that stick out in my mind because, you know, if you're a young person, you're going to be a lot less likely to pay for things that you, don't, that you do not believe you need. But if you have healthier people who are opting out of an overall pool, that could cause insurers to want to reduce what it is they cover. It could drive up costs for people who really need care. And then people who really need care, they, some of these people will not be able to receive care. And it's so it's challenging all across the board. And so I do think it's an interesting exercise and in, in the philosophy behind personal right. responsibility and what we can rely on the public to do. But I mean, again, the Republicans are going to run into a challenge that is similar to what the Democrats did. The Democrats tried to mandate what you know what you had to do to balance this program and then because the policy was incomplete and because it was flawed that system basically was collapsing now the republicans are saying well if you don't opt in or if you've let your uh, your coverage lapse you're shut out for six months so what do you do in six months if something happens to you and you can't get coverage because you're in the penalty box we are talking about people's lives not putting a child in time out and so that's also a harsh way of looking at things. So I, I think it's complicated. She, she said it as best as I could. It's a more of a philosophical approach to healthcare. It, it is a philosophical approach, but I think one of the key things you have to remember is that choice that that individual makes if, affects everybody else. Because when that healthy person determines they don't want to be on an insurance plan and they stay out, the, the entire population of, uh, that's covered becomes older and sicker and more costly, at which point the health insurance plans don't want to don't want to cover anybody and they pull out of the market. And so there are some key bright lines, I think, in healthcare. Do you do a mandate? Do you not do a mandate? Do you cover pre-existing conditions or do you not? But if you don't address them all together, you're never going to come up with a risk profile that actually is functional that people can afford. I think coverage is fantastic. I think coverage, covering pre-existing conditions is necessary, but there has to be a creative way to do that where you have a market that works. Because if it's too expensive for anybody to afford, it's not worth having at all. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add to that, you know, one of the things that we're also going to have to face is our aging population, our baby boomers, and, and, and knowing that as people get older, things change and they need more care. And that is going to be a significant population of people. So is this policy future focused enough to say we are prepared for this? I don't think that it is. Yeah. And job security for those millennials in the healthcare field to <laughs> take care of those older other people. <laughs> Let's take a quick commercial break. Let's come back and talk about some pure politics in this healthcare debate. And maybe I will let Jessica and Robert throw each other a question here. Maybe. We'll see. We're going to take a quick time out. We're back with more right after this. Arkansas Electric Cooperative Corporation provides electric energy across two-thirds of Arkansas. This is an exciting time in our energy history, with incredible progress being made in renewable energy and storage technologies. As our energy portfolio continues to diversify, we'll maintain an all-the-above strategy to provide reliable and affordable electricity. Ever since the first light bulbs were placed in our members' homes, the electric cooperatives have been the solutions provider for our members, and we want to continue that well into the future. Each day, the promise of our nation begins again. Arkansas and America moving forward. I help make that promise a reality. It's not for everyone, but people everywhere depend on us. Trucking delivers or everything stops. And that's what drives me. Welcome back to Talk Business and Politics Daily. I'm Roby Brock. I'm joined by Jessica Deloach Saban and Robert Kuhn. We are talking health care. So, all right, before the break, we talked a lot of policy wonk and some details and philosophies and theories. Let's talk pure politics here. Uh, Mitch McConnell, 
brought this bill forward thinking I got enough to get close enough to 50 votes with Mike Pence breaking the tie. It does seem now that it's come out publicly, there are a lot of, there's some wavering on the GOP side. A couple of moderate Republicans and some conservative Republicans. Robert Kuhn, coming to you first. What's it going to take to get this bill passed and is it going to pass before the July 4th recess? I'm going to say it does not pass before the July 4th recess. I think you've, like you've said, you've got moderates that are worried about um, coverage losses in Medicaid. You've got certain members that are worried about Planned Parenthood funding. And then you've got a whole group of conservative senators that, that think it doesn't do enough. And I don't think you can really get all those people to come to the middle together offering the same kind of you know, compromises. So I say it doesn't happen. Um, they could still try. We've seen the House bill kind of rose from the ashes like the Phoenix did, so <laughs> it's probably safer to, to give more time for input, but I wouldn't do it. Before July 4th, and no. what's it going to take to get it passed? Not before July 4th. I mean, anything's possible, but I would say not before July 4th. Here's what I think it will take. Robert basically just gave a pretty uh, accurate summary of where we are with all the different factions of people. I think that the smartest move would be able to, it, it would be for the Republican leadership to do something that appeals to Democrats, because Democrats really do have a track record of coming through and saying even though I do, I do not like what you have put forward, we are going to have to do something. And I do think that if there is some compromise to be had, throwing that in the direction of the Democrats would be the smart move. But I also understand the political ramifications of doing that when you have an election cycle wow, on your heels. That's an interesting dynamic. That's a good theory. I, you know, we'll see if that happens. So if she does, you're buying her lunch. <laughs> yeah, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I told I would uh, told everybody you guys could give each other a question to each other. Jessica, I'll let you ask the first question to Robert. Robert, you get to ask a question back to Jessica. Yeah. I get to stay out of this part of the show. Okay. Well, I wanted to talk about mental health and uh, funding for mental health. So, uh, you know, there have been some very bad things that have happened recently in Washington, D.C. I mean, the shooting that occurred in Virginia, the attack on our elected officials. And because of that, there was a renewed conversation into mental health and funding for programs and research in this country. And so I want to know if you think that this legislation does enough to begin addressing mental health issues in this country because right now it's set for $2 billion. But if you think about that, comparatively speaking, for 50 states, that's really just a drop in the bucket. Well, what I'd start with saying is I think mental health is, is for, t for too long been kind of the throwaway line that everybody says we really ought to focus more on mental health and then they don't. Um, so the answer is probably it doesn't, but I think that some of those solutions honestly need to come from the state level uh, where it needs to be a real priority, not just a, a talked about priority. Uh, and, and funding comes along with that. So I would hope under some of the waivers and some of the flexibility they would give to the states that it would become a real priority with money behind it because I do think it's necessary. All right, Robert, you get to ask the question. Well, my, my question's inspired by, by, by what she said <laughs> earlier, which is do you think that uh, it's even possible for any Democrat to come vote for whatever bill comes from, from the Republicans on this issue? I think that it is, I mean now, Will it be easy? No. Will there be some fit throwing beforehand? Probably so, because both parties are very guilty of posturing in so many ways. But they also protest genuinely, and I do think that there's some genuine protest to be had. But I think that this country is ready for us to get an answer on health care and our policy, knowing that it should evolve. And hopefully, if Democrats are allowed to have a seat at the table in actually crafting the policy that passes, there is a chance that we could get this done or at least start moving in the right direction, but they've been sidelined so far, so I don't know. I'm getting cynical in my old age. I think that's idealistic, but I applaud Listen, it and I want to see it happen. I want to see it happen. I want to see some, <laughs> I want to see some bipartisanship out of Washington, D.C. I'm too. very much ready for it. Jessica Deloge Saban and Robert Kuhn, great stuff as always. Thanks for y'all being here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And thank you for watching. That is all for today's Talk Business and Politics Daily. I'm Roby Brock. We'll see you next time. Thank you.